Uh, just a reminder that we are, because uh, of school holidays, we are on break, so there isn't any Sunday school, but uh, parents, there are um, some Sunday school sheets in the foyer, and uh, primary schoolers and teenagers, there's some sermon note sheets out the back so that you can jot down some points um, and see if you can get a little bit out of the message. So if you want to go and grab something out there, um, it's there waiting for you. Uh, for those who are visiting, we are working our way uh, through a series in Luke, and we're working verse by verse. But because it is the holiday break, uh, we normally break from the series. So uh, we have a, a, we're going to be looking at a different text this morning, pausing Luke. So if you have your Bibles, can you turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12? 1 Corinthians chapter 12. One Corinthians twelve. We're going to be starting from uh, verse one, and we're going to read uh, to thirty-one. If you have a Bible, please have it open, and then keep it open because we'll jump straight into the text. One Corinthians chapter twelve, verses one to thirty-one. Now, concerning spiritual gifts, brothers, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, you were led astray to mute idols, however you were led. Therefore, I want you to understand that no one speaking in the Spirit of God ever says Jesus is accursed. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except in the Holy Spirit. Now, there are a variety of gifts, but the same Spirit. And there are varieties of service, but the same Lord. And there are a variety of activities, but it is the same God who empowers them all in everyone. To each is given the manifestation of the Spirit for the common good. For to one is given through the Spirit the utterance of wisdom, and to another the utterance of knowledge according to the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healing by the one Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another, the ability to distinguish between spirits, to another, various kinds of tongues, and to another, the interpretation of tongues. All these are empowered by one and the same Spirit who apportions to each one individually as he wills. Verse 12, For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body, so it is with Christ. For in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slaves or free, and all were made to drink of one spirit. For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, where would be the sense of hearing? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. If all were a single member, where would the body be? As it is, there are many parts, yet one body. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the foot, I have no need of you. On the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And on our unpresentable parts are treated with great modesty, which our presentable parts do not require. But God so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it, that there may be no division in the body, but that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. Now you are the body of Christ and individually members of it. And God has appointed in the church first apostles, second prophets, third teachers, then miracles, then gifts of healing, helping, administrating, and various kinds of tongues. Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Are all teachers? 
Do all work miracles? Do all possess gifts of healing? Do all speak with tongues? Do all interpret? But earnestly desire the higher gifts, and I will show you a still more excellent way. It's God's word. Please keep the passage open. Over the last, I think it's probably been maybe three decades, you would notice a change in tone uh, by Christians about how we describe Christianity. You would no doubt uh, have heard or might be part of your vocabulary the phrase, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. Yes, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. And you can see how we've come to that, right? We look around and there's big cathedrals, there's big buildings, there's a lot of rituals, there's a lot of religious stuff going on. And, and the church Christians are trying to say all of that stuff, it's all a smokescreen, it's all a distraction. People get all, all hyped up in and all caught up in all the ceremony while their hearts are far from God. And so Christians have tried to emphasize that that stuff doesn't matter. It's all about knowing Jesus. And so we have the phrase, Christianity is not a religion, it's a relationship. And, 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 and has some merits. But we need to think about the consequences of what this statement has started to breed, though, in people's thinking. Have you also heard people increasingly begin to speak about their faith this way? My Christianity is just my faith and God. It's just me and Jesus. It's my relationship with Him. I don't need all of that church stuff. It's just me and Jesus. And it started to breed this kind of individualistic kind of Christianity. All that matters is just me and Jesus have our thing. I want to share just a little story um, from a few centuries ago, uh, but I came across it and it was uh, really insightful. Let me just share it with you. In a certain mountain village in Europe, a nobleman wondered what legacy he should leave to his townspeople. At last, he decided that he would build them a church. No one saw the complete plans for the church until it was finished. When the people gathered, they marveled at its beauty and completeness. However, someone soon asked, But where are the lamps? How will the place be lighted? The nobleman pointed to some brackets that were in the walls, and then he gave to each family a lamp which they were going to bring with them each time they came to worship. And he then said to them, Each time you are here, the area where you, seat, where you are seated will be lighted. Each time you are not here, that area will be dark. This is to remind you that whenever you neglect meeting with your brothers and sisters, some part of God's house will be dark. Now, the nobleman who had all of this money to build the church, he could have built the church with fixed lighting and lighting already set up. But what he wanted to do is he wanted to leave the responsibility of the light in the church up to the members of the congregation. And he was trying to make his point abundantly clear. The pastor is not the most necessary member of the church. The leaders are not the most necessary part of the church nor the musicians, but rather each member is vital to the life of the church. Each has a part to play, and when they are missing, their absence is felt. So this is his point, and really I think this con uh, confronts the individual Christianity, this individualistic Christianity that is seeping in and creeping in. And what we're going to see in this passage, Paul wants to remind the Corinthians that no Christian is an island. No Christian is solo. So as we jump into this text, I know there's a bit of an introduction, but as we jump into the text, let's pray that God will give us insight into this vitally important passage. Would you, would you pray with me for a moment? Father, we thank you for this text. Lord, we, we know it's important already because it's in the Scriptures. And so, Lord, we pray that you would open our eyes to understand. Um, Lord, we pray that we wouldn't just leave with more information this morning 
but we pray, Lord, that we would be like clay that is moldable in the, in the potter's hands. We pray that we would be receptive and responsive. Lord, we pray that the truth would be taught, uh, not error. Help me, help all of us here. May Christ be lifted up. May he get the glory. And Lord, may this all happen because your spirit is at work in this place. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So we're in, we're in 1 Corinthians 12 here. Um, and again, 1 Corinthians 12 uh, to 14 is really, the whole section is on spiritual gifts. And here the gifts were being misused. Now, some members thought that they, they were superior because of their giftedness. Now, when you get to chapter 14, Paul's going to confront how wrongly they were using the gifts. In chapter 12, he's going to confront their attitudes about the gifts. And that's why you get 1 Corinthians 13 is all about love. It's kind of the hinge, right? Your attitude stinks. The practice of it stinks because you're missing love. Okay? And so here, though, we're not going to get into the practice so much of the gifts, but uh, chapter 12, the attitude behind it. So this morning, if you're uh, taking notes, our, our first point this morning, the church is likened to the human body. The church is likened to the human body. Now, Paul starts off here, uh, verse 12, and he gives us a human anatomy 101 lesson. Uh, look at verse 12. For just as the body is one and has many members, and all the members of the body, though many, are one body. So now he talks about the human body as one singular unit that is composed of many different parts, limbs, organs, cells. And so the glory of the human body is that it is a single unit, but it is made of so many different parts. That's the glory of the human body. And all of these different parts make up one person. No human has multiple bodies. One. And so the human body is an amazingly profound entity with complex components. I have just a few um, images. You know me, I'm not much of a slideshow uh, kind of guy, but I, these I think will be helpful um, if we can have the image on the screen um, I think that's a snowflake. The human tongue considered, it's made of several muscles, is considered almost the strongest in all of the body, not quite. Our tongue used to, to taste, to eat, to swallow. God made our tongue with approximately 2,000 taste buds on it. 2,000. It's a lot of food to enjoy. Just the next one there. The human eye the human eye within it has two million working parts. Two million. Now, if you're to liken the eye to a camera, it has a 576 megapixel lens. If you want some perspective on that, the new iPhone 15 has a 48 megapixel lens. God gave us eyebrows and eyelashes to protect this wonderful creation. Just on to the next one. Thanks, Ollie. And then we have the brain sending messages to the whole body, absolutely dependent on another vital member, the lungs. It depends on the lungs to bring it oxygen. It takes up 20% of the body's oxygen. And it's sending nerve impulses to our body members at a speed of 274 kilometers per hour. It has approximately, our brain is made up of 100 billion neurons. And those are just there, a few members of the body. We could talk about the liver, the ears, the nose, different tendons, bones, blood vessels, and the like. Thanks, Ollie. King David, he didn't know all of this about the human body, right? But he knew enough to write in uh, Psalm 139, 14, I praise you because I'm fearfully and wonderfully made. Your works are wonderful. I know that full well. And it's obvious. And now out of all the things that God has created in this universe, it almost seems that the human body is the pinnacle of his creation. 
most glorious. It's immeasurably complex. It's made of millions of components that are different in size and shape. Each of them is so remarkably different. And yet all of them come together to compose this harmonious symphony. One piece. And yet, so harmonious is this symphony. If one member, if one limb is severed from the body, it will wither and die. You can have an orchestral symphony on the stage, and if you take one member off that stage, they can keep playing by itself, and the band can keep playing by itself. But if a limb of the body is severed off to the side, it will wither and die. So harmonious is this thing God has made. Now, what, why the biology lesson? Well, in the Bible, God uses a variety of different metaphors to describe the church. He calls it a family, a household, a living temple, a bride, a people. But one of the most powerful and profound and repeated metaphors used of the church is the body. The body. Verse 12 and all the members of the body, though many are one body, so it is with Christ. So just as the human body is made up of many parts, it says here, so is Jesus' body. Not his physical body. Not his physical body. It's a metaphor here. And in the church, we see the church is not simply just a body of Christians. He says the church is the body of Christ. The very body of Christ. Now, why is this metaphor so profound? Because so many different people make up one body. I mean, eyes and ears are so different to each other, but they form one body. And look how different he says the church is. Look in the middle of verse 13. What's it made up of? Jews or Greeks, slaves or free. These were the biggest dividing lines in history. The rich and the poor and Jewish people and the rest of the world. And yet, these different ethnicities and social classes is so different, and yet they're made one people. And so we have to ask the question, how can such dissimilar people be made one? Now think about marriage. What do you have? You have two people becoming one flesh. That is a miracle. Why? Because that is two sinners being joined together to travel life together and do it as one person. That is a miracle. And so my follow-up question is, if it's a miracle for just two sinners to become one, how then do you get hundreds of very different people coming together to form one body? How, how is that possible? By another miracle. And what's the miracle? He tells us. Have a look at it in verse 13. Here's the miracle that happens. Verse 13, for in one spirit, we were all baptized into one body, Jews or Greeks, slave or free, and all were made to drink one spirit. And so do you see what's happened here? The many encounter the one. The many experience the one. Humanity experiences the divine. Who do we, who do we encounter? It says the one spirit. And that is the Holy Spirit. And you see his twofold ministry here. There's two workings of the Spirit. Look, one, it says, we were baptized by one Spirit into one body. And two, we were all given the one Spirit to drink. Let's look at those two. We were all baptized by one Spirit into one body. This is not, Spirit baptism is not referring to speaking in tongues. This is commonly taught today. To be baptized in the Spirit is to speak in tongues. This is not true. How do we know this? Look, what did he say in verses 29 and 30? Are all apostles? Are all prophets? Do all speak in tongues? And the answer is no. But what does he say here? We were all baptized with one Spirit. So it cannot mean, baptism in the Spirit cannot mean speaking in tongues. Because we have all, he says, experienced the baptism of the Spirit. What is it? It's not water baptism either. It's not what he's talking about here. Baptism of the Spirit. He's talking about an immersion by the Spirit where we are plunged like a heavenly flood that comes down. All of us are brought down and we are immersed into the body of Christ, into the family of God. We are united by the Spirit with Jesus Christ. 
We live, in, we live on earth. Jesus is at the right hand of God. And it still says that Christ lives in us. We live on earth. Jesus is seated at the right hand in heaven. And Ephesians 2 says we are seated with Christ in the heavenly places. We have been by the Spirit immersed into Christ. And this happens the moment a person is saved and born again. A moment they believe in Jesus Christ, they become a member. They become a limb. They become an organ. And they join to Christ. We're all baptized by one spirit. And then he says, we're all given one spirit to drink. This is now not just this work upon us, but now there's a receiving work that happens. We were all made to drink. This is the pouring out of the Holy Spirit in our lives. What does Romans 5 verse 5 say? It says, God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. The love of God fills our hearts by the Holy Spirit that he pours into us. This is a drink that we have all, every single Christian has partaken of. And you know, he says, he says, we all, isn't this marvelous? Paul says, the same Holy Spirit that the apostles received is the same Holy Spirit that every Christian receives. Doesn't matter what your gift is. It doesn't matter if you're a long-standing Christian or a Christian for one day. You have the same spirit that the apostles had. We all have the one spirit. All of us. Note the emphasis. We all, one body, one spirit. Our unity. Our unity that we have is based on the shared experience we have of the one Holy Spirit. And what does this mean? That means if we have the one Spirit and He's made us one, we must be so on guard to protect ourselves from everything that would divide the body of Christ. And tell me in recent years, haven't there been enough things that have come against the church? Have there not COVID nearly obliterated God's people? Even just recently, the voice to parliament. Christians are fighting about it. What's next? What's next? I think it's going to be climate change. I really do. It's almost a new religion now. We must be so on guard. There are many current issues, but we cannot let them divide us. We must think through them. We must open our Bibles, but we must not devour each other. And let God speak from his word. Christ came to die to make us one. And the Holy Spirit was sent to gather us as one. That's what has been done. And so this is a beautiful metaphor, isn't it? First point, the church is likened to the human body. Secondly, this morning, if you're taking notes, being a body means there's no place for envy. Being a body means there's no place for envy. In verse 14, Paul repeats himself, For the body does not consist of one member, but of many. Why does he repeat himself? Now he wants to flesh out the implications. Okay, if we're likened to a body, then now we need to see the implications of this. Because we are different parts, it means we're going to have different roles and different functions. And because we're so different, this could lead to friction points in the church, right? People so different... And so now he addresses this. Look at verse 15 and 16. Again, he's using the metaphor. If the foot should say, because I'm not a hand, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. And if the ear should say, because I'm not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. Now, what's Paul addressing here? Again, the context is the Corinthians have so many different gifts. God has allocated different gifts to them. But Paul's seeking to encourage those who feel that they got a raw end of the deal with the Holy Spirit. My gift doesn't seem to be as good as other people's gifts. And this is really important because this is a prevalent pain that the church feels in every generation. It really is. This is the Christian who feels inferior. This is the Christian who feels that they're insignificant or worthless. This is the Christian who feels they have nothing to contribute. And they even get to this point. If I left the church, absolutely nothing would change. And the kingdom of God wouldn't be slowed down one kilometer. That's, that's the mindset. That's what ends up happening. Now, what does this look like practically? This is someone saying, well, I can't preach. I can't lead a Bible study. 
I can't sing and I can't play an instrument. I can't, I am not gifted to teach children and young people. I can't do these things. So I could leave this place and they're doing so much and nothing would change. Nothing would change. You know, this is very common in churches. It's a very real struggle. I am irrelevant. What was happening in Corinth? A number of them were given the gift of prophecy and tongues and the word of knowledge. These were big speaking gifts where everyone's listening to you, where you're up the front. But others, they were given different gifts like generosity, mercy, administration, help and compassion, not upfront gifts, not gifts that were seen in the worship service. And so they begin to feel unimportant and irrelevant and lesser of the body. Now, every church, every church is different. Every church has its quirks. Every church has its traditions, its unique practices. Some of them are good and some of them are bad. And, and, and one church um, that we were part of, every year they had this tradition. And close to December, in the, in the church service, they would call up all the people, all the people who served in children's ministry, all of them, in whatever facet, they would call them up, stand them up, Everyone would see them, then they'd bring them to the front on the stage, and they would be publicly thanked and, and applauded, and uh, then we would all pray for them. Um, the whole church would pray for them, and they'd be standing up the front for quite a while. Now, it seems good, and it's, and it's right to recognize people, but this used to uh, make Brooke and I feel uneasy. And what was the problem? Because such a, such a public honoring was never done for anyone else who served in the church or for any of the other ministries in the church. The hardworking deacons were never brought up the front. Those who worked on the property and maintenance were never brought up the front. The ladies who were busy cooking meals and dropping off meals to, to, to new mums and to those who were sick, they weren't. And, and the men who were discipling other men in private in their homes, they weren't recognized. And those who every week were opening up their homes for hospitality, they were missed. No, it was just the children's Sunday school servers every year up the front. Now listen, by elevating some gifts and ministries, we can unintentionally be stirring up envy and discontentment in the body of Christ. We can. In Paul's words, what does he say? Ears start envying eyes and feet start envying hands. What's going on here? The ears keep lamenting everything they keep hearing about the eyes. Aren't the eyes so wonderful for everything they see? And the feet are lamenting what everyone keeps saying about the hands. Look what the hands done. Look what they built. Look what they're doing. It's a recipe for disaster because the ears are discontent and the eyes are becoming proud, which we're going to see soon. So how does Paul deal with this sad and sorry state? Two ways here, and it's so wonderful. He shows them the wisdom of God in the body of Christ and the sovereignty of God in the body of Christ. Let's look at these two things. First, the wisdom of God. And again, he draws from the metaphor. Look at verse 17. If the whole body were an eye, where would the sense of hearing be? If the whole body were an ear, where would be the sense of smell? Then verse 19. If all were a single member, where would the body be? And so he's saying here, our differences are not something to bemoan. Our differences are for our benefit. They benefit the church. They benefit the world. Our varying gifts are not for rivalry. They're to complement each other. And he says the irony here is using a bit of humor. If we were all the same body part, we would be hindered in every single way. Can you, and he says, can you imagine if all the body was one part, one particular member? I mean, can you imagine this figure that was this person that was just made up of hands. I mean, it's a grotesque image. Imagine watching that thing trying to walk. And again, he's using irony here. And he's trying to say, this would be ridiculous if you could all do the same things. And see, the church here is not likened to an Olympic rowing team. An Olympic rowing team, everyone has to have strong arms. Everyone has to be a powerful rower. And if you can't row as fast as the person in front of you, you're out of the team. The church of Christ is not a rowing team. Not everyone has to be able to run 
Not everyone has to be able to lift. Not everyone has to be able to see and do and all these other things. No, no, we're different. We're all different parts. And friends, a body that is healthy is one where every part is doing its role. That's a healthy body. The body is strongest when all the parts are functioning together and in sync. And Paul says, some of you are being elevated, but you are all necessary. You all have a part to play. So this is the wisdom of God, right? But then he points them to the sovereignty of God. Look at verse 18. But as it is, God arranged the members in the body, each one of them as he chose. Each one of them as he chose. So here, Paul says, God has arranged each member of the church according to his choosing. So where it says there, as he chose, it means according to his pleasure. According to his pleasure. So I want you to think about this. God chose your gifting. God gave you your gifting. And here's the icing on the cake. It pleased God with what he gave you. That's what he says here. And that's why it says, we are God's handiwork. We are God's handiwork. We're his workmanship. Now, we started off, I showed you the slideshow because I wanted you to see, look at the detail that God puts in the human eye. Look at the detail that he puts in the tongue. Look at the detail that he puts into the brain. And in the same way, God is saying, I have put time into you. I've saved you. I've given you the Holy Spirit. I've equipped you. I've brought you into the body. And each one of you are exactly where I have chosen exactly where I've chosen. I put you where I wanted you to be. And so, friends, let me, let me say to you, if God has gifted you in a way that pleases Him, it pleases Him, then don't live envying others for what they can do in the body of Christ. Don't envy them. And, and again, let me ask you, are you serving in God's church and serving His people according to the way that He has gifted you? Are you doing that? If you're not, it might be a result of envy. And you might say, I don't envy anyone. But listen, envy is so far back because what happens? Envy leads to withdrawal. And withdrawal leads to idleness. And idleness is disobedience. Because we're not doing what he told us. So we envy. And so we withdraw and we step back. And then we fall into idleness. And we're no longer serving God. Now, let me, tell, let me ask you this. What happens in the church when members don't use their gifts? What happens? What happens when the body doesn't use its gifts? What happens? The body soon becomes in need. And the body senses its need, right? So what does the body do? There's this gaping need here. We feel it. Something's not functioning as it's supposed to. So what does the body do? Other parts start to step up to do the work, right? So feet start picking up the slack of the hands and ears start trying to do the work of eyes. And then great harm starts to be before the body. Why? You know what happens? What happens when you try and lift something with your back? You're in big trouble, aren't you? Why? Because the back's not designed to lift. It's supposed to be the hands, the arms, and the core of the abdomen. But when a body is not functioning healthy, and people aren't using their gifts that God has chosen and given them, then other members start picking up the slack. And they start doing what other members should be doing, and the body becomes hurt. It becomes hurt. Friends, true blessing comes when the church functions according to God's design, each part as he chose doing its part. See, friends, when we grasp the wisdom of God, and the sovereignty of God and how he's gifted us, and gifted us and formed us, what does it do? It produces oneness and unity. This was the antidote for the Corinthian church. And so Paul's saying here, don't just attend. You are vital. You are part of a body. And the body needs you. And God's people need you. And here, again, for the third time, look at verse 20. He repeats the phrase. I mean, this is the third time now. Verse 20, as it is, there are many parts, yet one body. So we've seen here, uh, being a body means that there's no place for envy. And just lastly, this last section, being a body means there's no place for arrogance. This is really important. Being a body means there's no place for arrogance. 
Now, he deals here with the church where they were becoming arrogant, and he borrows from the metaphor again. Look at verse 21. The eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor again the head to the foot, saying, I have no need of you. Now, again, the context of the letter, when you read chapter 11, what was happening? They were coming together for the Lord's Supper, but the rich people weren't waiting for the poor Christians. The poor Christians were slaves, and they couldn't just leave work whenever they wanted to. But the rich and the wealthy and the masters, they were coming together having communion, and the poor Christians were turning up, and the rest of the congregation was gorged with food, and some of them were drunk. Paul says here, in the worship gathering, it gets just as bad. Some of you are speaking in tongues and prophesying, and you're looking down on all the others who can't speak like you. This is members of the church or leaders who deem themselves above everyone else. We are the important ones of the congregation. It doesn't matter if that person leaves or that person leaves or if they don't come. It's an attitude of, I don't need you. I came across a great analogy from John, John Calvin, the 16th century theologian and reformer alongside Martin Luther, played a major role in the Reformation. And, and, and John Calvin, he gives this uh, illustration, this little parable, as it were. I paraphrased it because uh, old English is brutal. Um, so I've, I've just summarized him. He'll be okay with that. Here's the illustration. He says, I want you to imagine this scene. Imagine the hands, the mouth, the teeth, and the tongue all conspired together against the stomach. Each of them was sick of caring for the stomach and its frequent demands. So the hands said first to the rest, we won't carry any food to the mouth. The mouth joined in and said, I won't accept anything that's offered to me from anyone. And the teeth also chimed in and said, even if something gets in, I'm not going to chew it. It's not getting down. And then lastly, the tongue says, I'll be the last line of defense. I won't let anything get down past the throat. And so with an angry spirit, the hands, the mouth, the teeth, and the tongue conspired against the stomach to beat it into submission. However, they soon realized that they were becoming increasingly weak. Not just them, but the entire body was beginning to shut down. It soon became incredibly clear that the stomach, which needed regular attention, was no inferior member after all. The stomach was not only a consumer, but a giver. Its demand to be nourished was so that it could nourish the rest of the body. See what's happening here? The prominent members in the congregation at Corinth thought they were so much greater than everyone else, the inferior ones. They said, we don't need them. They're so demanding. They're so demanding. Friends, they needed each other. And see, this is the attitude that stems from an unhealthy individualism about it's just me and Jesus. It's just me and him. And it becomes an inflated view of self and an attitude of I don't need others. And again, we're constantly bombarded with this because we, we look up to the solo figures as, history, um, as heroes, right? Think of the likes of Bear Grylls. He can survive anything all by himself. He doesn't need the help of anyone. Put him anywhere on the planet and he's fine. I mean, we look up to and we esteem, esteem those people who were the underdogs and they get to the top all by themselves. No outside help. By sheer determination and grit, they did it. They made it. Individualism. Can I tell you the perfect example of this kind of Christian? It's the Christian who could come to church but doesn't come to church. They feel no need. They can do it alone. They see no benefit. It's just me and God and my relationship with Jesus. What does Paul say that kind of Christianity is? That's the eyes saying to the ears, I don't need you. Again, you, you might not like to hear that, but that, that's what he's saying here. The eyes saying to the ears, I don't need you. I don't need the feet. I don't need the stomach. I don't need any of that. And they might say, well, I have another Christian friend that I can catch up with. That's not sufficient. Why? Because the body is made up of more than just two limbs. You need blood vessels. You need intestines. You need a stomach. You need a liver. You need all of these things. 
And that's what the body of Christ is made up of. God is showing us, yes, we are individual members, but we are interdependent members. We need each other. Let me quote David Garland here. He says this, One person alone, no matter how gifted, cannot play a Beethoven symphony. They cannot act a Shakespearean tragedy or compete against another team. One person cannot do that. The same is true in the church. It can never be a solo performance. Just this past week, Brooke and I had a meal with a couple from our congregation. Um, and we were, we were speaking to them and, um, and we asked them for just parenting advice. We were chatting with just parents. You know, what, what's some wisdom that you have that you can share with us? Because we're on this journey and we need help too. And we asked them and they were sharing things that they had done and how God had used their efforts. And, and they said to us, they said to us, you know, we just want to thank you guys for your ministry to us. And we said, we, we want to thank you for your ministry to us. You, you're helping us. You're ministering to us. It's the same if I go and visit someone. You finish the coffee, finish the tea, pray together. And they might obviously say, thank you, Nathan. Thank you for coming to visit me. I, I needed this. I needed this fellowship. And I'm compelled to say right back to them each time, don't you understand? I needed this too. You are encouraging me. We are together. We're building each other up. This is what it's all about. The parts working together. See, the temptation is for those who are in high positions here, where he says with the arrogant, to look down on those who are lower. See, it's the eyes saying here, it's the eyes to the hand and the head to the feet. People who are up the top looking down on others. And he says, don't be arrogant against each other. And so on the flip side, I've talked about those who, who come but don't want to serve. But then Paul deals with another danger and says, those of you who are doing serving and are doing a lot of work and feel like you're carrying the church on your shoulders, be careful because you might think that the ones who aren't contributing aren't needed. You see that? We must be careful. We must be careful. And so how does Paul address this? I mean, he's dealing with those who are, who are not helping out the body and then he's dealing with those who are doing so much that they think that they're the only important ones. How, how does he deal with this? Look at verses... 22 to 24, and we're running out of time as always. Verse 22, on the contrary, the parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. And on those parts of the body that we think are less honorable, we bestow the greater honor. And our unpresentable parts are treated with greater modesty, which our more presentable parts do not require. But God has so composed the body, giving greater honor to the part that lacked it. And you see there, he talks about parts of the body that seem weak and indispensable. The people, if they don't come back to our church, it doesn't really matter. We keep going. And he's saying, no, 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 that's not how the body works, right? Think about it. If you break a, a toe, a little toe, one little toe, you're struggling to walk. Think how small and microscopic nerves are. If one of those nerves is pinched, you're not going to work today. You're in bed, right? And, and so these things, are, they seem weak, they seem so small, but they're vital. They're vital, he's saying here. And some people in the congregation, they might need more attention and more ministry to them. But Paul says, praise God. They're giving you an opportunity to love them, be patient with them, and to serve them. The smaller parts are not indispensable here. And then he says, the less honorable parts we treat with special honor. And so, you know, you've got the eyes and the arms and the legs, and, and they seem to be the hard workers in that, and, and they're the ones that are on display. But you know what's interesting? And they get the recognition, but you know what's interesting about eyes, arms, legs? You can survive without them. You can. Cut an arm off, you can be sewn up. Cut a foot off, you can still survive. But then there are the less honorable parts, right, that don't look as nice the inner organs, the blood vessels, the kidneys, the livers, the lungs. I mean, you start getting rid of these things, you can't survive. I mean, they're the less honorable parts. And he's talking about people in the congregation. They're unseen. They're not up the front. They do stuff behind the scenes. And Paul says, don't you dismiss them. They might be ministering from their kitchen at home. They might be sending text messages and encouraging the weak believer. Don't you despise them. 
friends, our culture honors those who are already honored. And Paul says the church isn't like that. The weakest parts, we put great honor on. The ones who are working hard behind the scenes, they're the heroes. And we give them great honor, he says here. And then he says, our unpresentable parts are treated with great modesty. And you don't need a PhD in anatomy to know what he's talking about here. Our unpresentable parts, in, in modern English, we would say our private parts. And he says, them we treat with special modesty. Just like Adam and Eve, when they realize they're naked, what do they do? They, they quickly attend to themselves and they cover themselves. And he says, here, just because we're covered doesn't mean those parts of the body are not important. If we don't have them, that's the end of the human race. We face extinction. But again, those are parts that are concealed. They don't get the honor. And he's trying to use the analogy here to show the lowest in the fellowship. Don't despise them. Don't despise them. And do you see the wisdom of God here? It's just remarkable. He says, you've got the workhorses, but then you've got the others behind the scenes, and all of them are doing a part. And even those who seem to be the lowest and the weakest, they're indispensable, and the body can't survive with them, so we give them the greater honor. And this is wonderful. When we give the weakest the greater honor, honor, it helps a congregation not to get too wrapped in their pastor. That was the problem with Corinthians, isn't it? Chapter 1, I'm of Apollos, I'm of Cephas, I'm of Paul. They're holding up a man. They're holding up leaders. And he says, don't do that. We give the greater honor to the weakest among us. The smallest. See, friends, it's not about the upfront gifts. It's about, if you get anything, it's about every single part working together. Working together. And the body becomes healthy. And just here, he wraps up verses 24 to 26. God has so composed the body, giving the great honor to the part selected, that there may be no division in the body, that the members may have the same care for one another. If one member suffers, all of them suffer together. If one member is honored, all rejoice together. This is how close we are to be. This is how much we're to care for each other. Think about it. You get a toothache. And it is raging. And the tooth is only this big. And the gum is infected. It's inflamed. But that's not the only part of the body that feels it. The whole body, because it's connected, the whole body's brought down. The whole body's frustrated and the whole body's struggling. So what does the body do for the tooth? The hand picks up the phone, books an appointment with the dentist. The feet get the body there. And then what happens when the tooth is fixed? The whole body rejoices. Because when one suffers, we all feel it because we're together. And when it's restored, there's rejoicing. There's rejoicing. Because we're one. We're one. We don't just turn up. This is family. This is the body of Christ. And he says again, verse 27, so it is with the church. You are the body of Christ. Friends, we were saved to be the body of Christ, in in the body of Christ, and to serve. We were saved to serve. What did Jesus tell his disciples? Who is the greatest among you? It is him who becomes the servant of all. And Jesus says, I'm going to show you true greatness. And the king of glory bends down and he starts washing his disciples' feet. What's he doing? Peter can't handle it. Stop it, Lord. Peter, you haven't seen anything yet because the very next day, that same king of glory lets his face be spat upon. And he doesn't turn his cheek. And he lets them punch him and slap him. And they start flogging him till his blood starts running to the ground. And then, without resistance, he's led like a lamb to the slaughter. Why? Because the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Behold our servant king. And then what does he do for us? He saves us, brings us into a body so that we might, with the wonderful gifts that he gives us, build each other up. Because, you know, he loves his bride. He loves his bride. You should be concerned for his bride. What has he given to me so that I may help his bride? Because I 